Thank you for tuning in to Androna Talks Radio. Gathering as one in our sovereign truth from a galactic perspective. Exploring our world with new ideas, knowledge and a promise of a better future. Galactic discussions for galactic minded people. Androna Talks. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on Andrana Talks Radio. Uh, we have a really exciting show today. Um, I want to talk about this book. I got this book, and it's just absolutely fantastic. If you ever wanted to learn about what's been going on over, I don't know, since the 60s, um, you'll see here this man, uh, Daniel M. Salter. And we have the privilege today of having his grandsons on the show. Daniel and Derek to Stefan. So uh, without further delay, we're going to get into that. And we're going to have a discussion about this book. We're going to do a multi-part series and kind of go through the content as much as we can to better understand the sequence of events that have been taking place over the past, I don't know, 40, 50 years. I mean, there's just so much information. And probably when this information came out, people didn't fully get it. They didn't realize that, you know, this is where everything is headed or they thought it was fictional to some degree or fabricated. And it really hasn't been. So um, uh, let's begin by I just wanted to um, read uh, the, the bio unless um, you guys would do the honor of doing that. Uh, welcome, uh, Daniel and Derek. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, yeah, great to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, I can great. read it. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. If you want. Please do. All right. Agent Daniel M. Salter is a retired former counterintelligence agent for the Scientific and Technical Unit of Interplanetary Phenomena in Washington, D.C. He was a member of the Pi Pilot Air Force NRO National Reconnaissance Office and DCCD Development of Conscious Contact Citiz Citizenry Department with the United States Military. He was a Conrad Courier for President Eisenhower with a clearance above, far above top secret, a Cosmos clearance, and a member of the original Project Blue Book. His expertise was in radar and electronics, his field of investigation, UFOs, aliens, and particleization. Uh, at the time of the book, he was 75 years old, and he uh, wanted to mention that he had both Comanche and French ancestry. His, his Native American ancestry is very important to him. I can see why. I mean, that is really important because it shows that connection to the earth and to the United States and to um, so much that the indigenous also always had a foresight and knowledge of what's going to happen on the planet. And so he probably was in this role uh, partially because of his ancestry and the natural intuition and, and understanding of of a connection to the stars and they always have they all indigenous groups have a history of being connected to star seeds to um visitors from other places and so uh you know extraterrestrial life so um let's get started because uh we have um a little bit of time we're going to do this we're going to try to cover four chapters in this one show and I do have some notes that I've been writing down. And so the first chapter uh, they talk about is, um, this is the Disclosure Project. And your grandfather, did he work directly with Stephen Greer? Because uh, Stephen Greer is mentioned here. Yes, he did. He, he, was, uh, he was a witness at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. when the... Um, all the disclosure project um, testimonials came forward um, for the disclosure project in 2001. So Dr. Greer had interviewed him ahead of time and gotten to know him and you know, familiar with his testimony and then brought him forward um, in May of 2001, I believe is when it happened, yeah. 
Did Dr. Greer also have some of the similar experiences uh, working for the government, working for Project Blue Book or some of these other, or did they just uh, come to a point where the, their lives intersected having a similar interest? Yeah, I can answer that. Yeah, Dr. Greer, I don't believe he had uh, direct links to, you know, the secret government, you could call it, or, or working in any of those departments. It was really them looking at the disclosure project movement in the 90s, looking for all these whistleblowers or these people that were willing to testify, break their secrecy of oath of all so many years over their lives. So those brave people that were willing to do that, he was going and scouting out across the U.S. and then trying to find these people. And somehow my grandfather, our grandfather was a part of that group. And, it, and it's interesting because he was one of the 20 witnesses that went to the press club hearing in 2001 out of uh, over 400, almost 500 witnesses overall that Dr. Greer reached out to, so. so yeah, that, seemed pretty well, I could see why. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it was not, he was definitely hands-on and very, very uh, personally involved and uh, met quite a few people. Um, I, I wrote down that uh, um, he also uh, mentions the ACIO in the first chapter, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the in the footage of him uh, from the disclosure project of the video, videotapes, um, when you look at the original footage, he in, in his interview he he brings up the ACIO as well. Um, you know, regarding them as the, the very high level when within the NRO, the the governments can have access to to that type of information. I have here on uh, page, I think it's I'm having trouble reading here. Uh, page six, I believe. Um, I guess he was, uh, for those on that level talking about their clearance, high uh, security clearance level, was also another worldwide group called the Advanced Contacts Intelligence Organization, ACIO. If you paid your dues and obeyed the rules, you could truly benefit from the information gathered by those government organization levels organization. Some of the military refer to these groups as the guardians of high uh, frontier, and I believe now that everyone in the world should be privy to what you know, what is known about the top secret organizations. This is why I have allowed these this information to be published now. So that's, yeah. he, he was able to get to, uh, and it's not really easy, to be invited into that role. But you have to also know that they need to know who that soul is. They have an identity. And so they, they understand that there is an association and there's a purpose. The person is working on multi levels, not just in the physical level, but in um, also an astral levels that there's also these communications and connections. And so they understand that. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are people, like you said, you pay your dues. Yeah, yeah sort yeah. of. There's a lot of people that have studied and really paid their dues, but mm -hmm. they don't all have security clearances. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Oh, that's okay. We, yeah, that's an interesting thing for us to know. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah oh, you're so, you're uh, the first person we've ever talked to with... Uh, you know, insight to the ACIO. So this is really exciting for us to to interact with you and to learn more about it. You know, the ACIO, you know, does a lot of telecommunication, like you know, their um, telepathic communication. They're right. not, you know, making phone calls. They're not, you know, writing letters and all of that. But it's it's very very profound. You you have a knowledge that they are communicating with you. And then they do direct you to certain things. So um, I find myself even like in my sleep, communicating and talking and looking at things. And so that they will, will do that. Uh, undoubtedly, they did that with your grandfather. Ah, okay. And I, I like that. I like how you're, well, the way you're kind of phrasing that, because I think for me, in my journey, it's always been about intuition and following your own intuition. And I think our grandfather 
must have obviously had access with his clearance to a lot of information. Um, and when he got, I don't know when that would have happened when he had find, found the access to ACIO, but he thought that was a very pivotal part of, of disclosure and what we needed to know. So uh, that, that part's interesting. And that he is the one, I guess, out of all the te te people testifying that would speak about it. <laughs> I don't know, you know, but that's, yeah. And I don't I believe don't any other witnesses mentioned it or talked about it. And I, I honestly haven't heard about it from any other sources through the disclosure movement since then over the past 20 or so years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, outside of the wing makers. The right, wing exactly. Makers, mm -hmm. And, and yeah. then there's um, some disinformation out there a little bit. Yeah. Of people that think they understand what it is and they're not really sure. And he was also tied, like you said, to the Native American side. He felt very, especially later in life, tied to that, his heritage in that way and that lineage and how they were tied so much to the earth and uh, Mother Earth, Mother Gaia, really, really going back to what we lost as, as we advanced, uh, you know, in technology and we didn't advance any more spiritually and we really did lose that, what we, what we once had. And I think he really wanted to bring that message home. And Nancy Redstars, who uh, helped to make this book, transcribed his what he was saying at the end and and put the book together. And she's a Native American. Um, I'm I'm not sure what which I think she's Cherokee. It says yeah. So she was really helpful, and she also knew about the Wingmakers' history. And I think she understood, like you said, the disinformation and all of all of what's being put out there. And our grandfather was very very um very clear in his message at the beginning that that's what the media is for that's what the government's here to do they're here to really disinform you get you into a mode of fear and anxiety about the et con the initial et contact and like the world the worlds with you know george orwell and all these things we see that we come out with and even he mentioned independence day you know that movie for one and uh you just see where the direction they're taking it and, and why they're trying to get us ready on that level, on that, on that level of consciousness and that lower level of, oh, fight or flight. They want us to stay in that state. And it's, it's sad, but that's why there's some of us trying to finally break through that, that barrier. Yeah. He covers a spectrum of, a broad spectrum of information. Like you said, mm -hmm. that he, 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 at some point talks about the Ramanyan, Ramanat, uh, the Bhag Bhagavad Gita, I can't Bhagavad even say Gita. it. Yeah, Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. Yep, and uh, the Ram Ramana Ramanyana, and mm -hmm. uh, the um, he talks about Buddha. He talks about all sorts of different uh, spiritual modalities, and then um, he talks about Majestic Twelve. I mean, it's just a really broad spectrum of information. Uh, I, 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 yeah, and uh, there's a quote in here about um, uh, the NSA being involved with uh, what information gets out. And so he's, he's literally sharing all the information that he knew from his experience and working with all of these different departments of the government. And this just should be a bestseller. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for people that are truly interested in disclosure, it's almost like it should be a handbook and get everyone on the same page. And what, and I'm not just flattering you, you know, I mean, people that have known me for years, I'm not one to do that, but I honestly believe that this is covering all the basics. If a person is going into disclosure and understanding what's been going on for all of these years, this is a, the best way to catch up is oh, yeah. to review the content here and see the sequence of events that, that brought us to this point. I agree. It's definitely like a foundational uh, mass of material that really helps to lay some groundwork on, um, on a perspective of how this stuff came about and to the extent that it went. And, and it was, came out in 2003. And I think at the time, like you mentioned, it, was, it wasn't portrayed. There wasn't enough people out there in this movement or, or awake enough to really take it for its, its true value. So... I'm glad to see that over time, more people are waking up to this and, and the truth with the, with more sources and, and ways of getting information like this. But it, it would be great to get the book out there more so more, more people could really understand and have this in their back pocket. 
Yeah, it would, just, it would help them because, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to make a disclaimer, you know, and I really thank you so much for saying what you're saying, because that's, 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 that's that means so much coming from you. But that we never make we never made any money off this. My grandfather never made any money off this book. Not even Nancy Red Star has made any money. I, we talked to her recently. This all just went to the publisher. And, you know, you can get it, of course, on Amazon or wherever. But it's not like we're here to make money. I, I could have tried to do that for the last 20 years. But like I, I didn't. Of course, I wasn't just promoting it just to promote a book. Now, now I realize the significance and where we're at right now as a civilization, where we're leading to, that it needs to be heard. It's not, it's not here because we want publicity or we want this or that. We want people to know the truth and, and hopefully we go in the right direction as a humanity together. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think whether people are basing their opinions and off of you know, different speakers that they hear, and I find that, you know, as I'm having discussions with people, they have, it's almost like piecemeal. They have a little bit of information from this person, a little bit from that person. And even if they were following someone that has a lot of information, they don't have the whole history or the backstory of how a lot of this evolves. So they're just catching what's going on right now. And so, like I said, I mean, I think that this, this is the book that you would kind of see the whole, um, uh, history of where everything came from and why certain decisions are being made because then otherwise then I see it's almost like they're not prepared they're not mm -hmm. fully knowledgeable and then when um, someone shows up and says you know hey I, I know everything about disclosure and they start talking and then some mm -hmm. of their information is is like there's there's no validation on um, mm -hmm. what they're saying but they're mixing it in with some truth and so right. then everyone's following them and it confuses everyone. And it's because they don't have a groundwork or um, a basis. You know, like if I were to put together a school, a disclosure school, this would be, <laughs> this would be the book that I would introduce <laughs> and have discussions. Yeah, and so, yeah. It's well written. Yeah. It's well written. And like I said, I, I have absolutely no reason to flat. I like you guys. I think you're really nice. Um, but that still is not... The reason why i'm saying this and and, I, and yes they do mention the acio but not a whole lot just just a little bit here and there because yeah. the acio is has been hidden intentionally and so uh but just enough that he was aware of it as he started getting involved in some of these these projects so um let's yeah. delve in a little bit more about some of this the spectrum of knowledge that he had and uh, how he explains things too, because um, he he really gets gets into some interesting things. Um, talk about the high security clearance. So he he talks about how there's levels of security clearance, and then there's an additional level. Has he ever talked to you, either one of you, about this? Dan, you want um, to answer that? <laughs> yeah, he he when I was so be, he passed in two thousand and seven. So we were mostly teenagers when we kind of got some information in the 90s from him um, when he was just starting to really be public about it and felt comfortable that he could start talking. And that's when he got in contact with Dr. Greer. And so with our family, he would tell us, you know, stories here and there of various different things. Um, and as young, a, a younger person, I, I really wasn't adept to receive it all or to understand it all but I, I did have the opportunities to learn a lot from him at a young age and you know going very much against anything i had ever heard mainstream made me a little skeptical i mean this is the only person that is saying this with my grandfather so i did trust him um but it certainly opened my mind to a lot of stuff um but he did discuss one of the things he did discuss with me was the um levels of um security clearance above top secret and at the time, I didn't recall, but reading the book, I, I mean, it, um, it, it, it um, reminded me, you know, he was, he was, he said cosmic clearance was at the top, cosmos clearance, um, and it dealt with, you know, UFOs, extraterrestrials, and particleization primarily. And uh, it, uh, according to the book, and I've seen other diagrams online since then, uh, the, the cosmos clearance is like 38 levels above top secret and um, several levels at least a dozen levels above the president of the United States. No president's ever been privy to that that type of level of clearance before. Um, 
and for you so, to be yeah. a part so, of it, you'd have to be purposeful. You'd have to have some kind of attribute that contributes to the knowledge as opposed to someone that's going to leak the knowledge or, um, you know, put, put uh, what are they, it's like national security or, or whatever um, yeah. concern that the government has at the time. And so that's why certain things, uh, certain pieces of information are limited. And uh, that's why sometimes Peter, you hear Peter, like he'll start talking and so you ask a question, he'll start talking in a circle and, you know, people say, well, he just doesn't know what he's saying. No, he does know what he's saying. He just is trying to talk around it and sort yeah. of let us know and hint to us what is actually happening without actually yeah. um, putting, he, I don't think he's so much worried about himself, but maybe for me, because uh, I'm doing the show. And so he's worried that you know that could be a problem and then if he gets cut off if we get cut off then we can't you know provide the information so he has to be a little careful and doesn't want that to happen and so um likewise um i'm sure that there they had a watch on your grandfather they had to use a lot of discernment um and there was a lot of a lot of fear around um him coming forward for, for, for fearing for you know what would happen if he said the wrong thing or or had the wrong information come out because uh, within these levels when you get the, so many levels it's so compartmentalized the level below you has never heard of the three levels up because they don't even know it exists it's it's just on a need to know basis so a lot of people aren't even aware that they they exist so you can imagine the kind of stuff that they you know conceal from from everyone and what, what they're dealing with and oh, yeah. just to I was going to just put it in perspective because when he was started the air in the air force, it was just right in the early fifties, right at the dawn of, you know, Roswell just happening in 47 and all these sightings were pretty common back then. And so when 50, he said 50, 51, 53, I think he had different encounters and the main one he, he, he spoke to us about, I remember being 10 years old and our mom saying, Hey, your grandfather has something to tell you, come, come to the table. So, we all heard that story and then we just were like okay let's go back to our normal lives i mean we took it in but we didn't know what to do with that information um and then like dan said it was just over time he would tell us little stories or say little things here and there but we didn't know what to make of it until he finally came out with the disclosure project in 2001 officially and this book which we had no idea he was even writing you know none of that our family didn't even know about so that was, is what makes it difficult too. I just wanted to say, you know, he started back then and that's maybe the reason why um, the clearance, he was able to get those higher levels of access because he was there from the beginning and he saw it, he saw it evolve over time. And it was back then when they could go in and of course they do background checks. He was adopted. He didn't, I mean, he's also part German. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. He's mainly German American. Um, there's a lot there's a lot of reasons and he's also freemason or he's claimed that he was and his great grandfather was 33rd degree mason so i'm sure they've taken a lot of these things into account but um i i, I think he was very much on on a path of knowing himself you know and wanting to learn more all the time uh and, and deeper knowledge and the mystery school teachings and things like that i think he stuck he actually taught the urantra book for one at the dallas college uh for a long time uh, in Mountain wow. View College, and yeah. so there's there's little things like that, um, but I think he his life path was, was meant to do that, and somehow running in, it sounds like the Forrest Gump of all like uh, military intelligence insiders, right? Like when you hear the story, it's like this is too unbelievable. But um, whether you and I was going to say this, whether you want to just um, say that he's like the biggest conspiracy theory guy you could ever imagine, and somehow have this information one way or another he's giving you vast amounts of information that can be very useful to what's happening right now um and i don't we don't think that he had had that capability even just to get on the internet and search for stuff he wasn't that kind of person like a computer guru when internet was just coming out to find these things like he had to have some kind of access already so it's the more we learned the more we realized like he really must have known a lot so. <laughs> Yeah. He, he did he had uh, he had a lot of detail about mm -hmm. certain things a lot yeah. of detail and it doesn't feel like he was copying from someone 
it was almost it was his his information so it, this was published in 2003 or was it 2001 when 2003 i see it yeah, yeah cuz that unless it was the second edition mm. okay so, yeah yeah so the book came out initially 2003 and the disclosure project was two years earlier so it was after he had you know felt that comfort level of being public about the information you know mm -hmm. did he say yeah, why I, he, did he get a clearance from someone to be able to share the information did someone die or something like that we don't I, know that yeah it's I, I think a lot of people within the disclosure project um they were they were just felt the safety in the numbers of people coming forward to, to break their oaths, you know, to, to, to disclose the information. Um, I think that had a lot to do with it, with Stephen Greer's ability to make everyone collaborate together and to round everyone up and, and have that com camaraderie and sense of uh, security almost, you know. But but I can tell you also that his, his health declined very fast after he came out and started talking about this. Right after 2001, he had some mini strokes and I don't think that's complete coincidence or at least that maybe the anxiety, all the stress involved with that was part of it. But it also made you doubt what he had to say because he wasn't full in his full capacity mentally or physically. He started to, you could see hard to speak, you know, he started to, um, you know, just decline uh, over time. Some of the interviews even were that way, but you knew that he knew something and there was a, there's a clear message he wanted to say. And he was the only one out of the press club hearing of the 20 some witnesses when he got on stand to say what he was going to say he froze up it was too much stress and he felt i think just too scared and he, he even left early from the conference my mom had to pick him up early because he's like i don't feel comfortable here anymore i have to leave so that's, yeah and he probably that's wouldn't voice exactly why yeah exactly yeah all you have to do is see someone in the crowd mm-hmm and you know, or a statement made in passing, and uh, it's pretty much on the table. Um, yeah. And they can do things that, you know, you could just be sleeping in a hotel somewhere and, and you know, things have happened with some of the mm -hmm. people that were providing information. Uh, yeah. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of detail, although um, some people, like I said, I've seen some of this information come out from other people some of it bits and pieces of it you know uh so it's particularly the topics but not all of it together like this and, and i think what's so important that it was right at the turn of you know right after you know 9 11 but when the internet is still so new and this is a this is a 70 some year old man that doesn't you know he doesn't have the the the, the know-how that we do just to get on the internet and that and that was very hard to find the stuff back then so to know that he was able to really put it all together back then says a lot to all the people now coming out with the information so yeah i think it's well that, that validates um, a lot. being a part of uh the masons would have probably allowed him to connect with those in government not necessarily the acio the acio was opposed of the masonic lodge um mm -hmm. but it's uh he it seems like he had everything that he needed in order to interact with whoever he needed to, to interact with and i also feel like he was able to talk but not say things that he wasn't supposed to say so he was he was mm -hmm. somewhat discreet and then when he thought he was clear it probably just uh still they they gave him a hard time um which I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised because they're not really, I, I even see Stephen Gray and he's very bold and he is right. Um, goes out publicly and says what he needs to, but I also see that he looks very frustrated at times. Yeah. Yeah. I, his, his story is quite an amazing story and, and the, the amount of information he's come out with is impressive. I was just going to say to tie that into his overall message, Dr. Greer's has always been, you know, the ETs are, he likes to say they're all good ETs and no bad ETs. And I think a lot of people disagree with him on that. But I think he has a point of what he's trying to say. And our grandfather also made that same point. We don't have to be the ones to fear the ETs. The only ones we have to fear is ourselves. And our, we are the ones that will cause our own destruction. And it's mainly because these 
our lower lower level elite lower level consciousness and these you know one percent of the pyramid that are interacting with these lower level ets those are the ones that are going to cause our demise but it's because they're giving consent and they're allowing that to happen and it's now time for the 99 percent to step up and say no more uh -uh. we 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 are going to stay take back the power and 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 call upon these benevolent ets that have been here all along trying to help us like nudge us in our evolution this whole time so he was very my grandfather definitely knew about that part of it yeah yeah there was um trying to think of which chapter that was um there was like a a prediction of a sequence of things that would happen mm -hmm. and False flags that they would they would come out with yeah yeah mm -hmm. i mean he he discusses it remember this is 2003 we haven't had the 2012 event and not that that was fully an event yet but um there was yeah it he just covered let me see if i could find the page where he talks about there was you know the, the things about um how we would be concerned about russia and then we would find out that it wasn't russia that there was oh i think it might have been verda von braun yeah I Talk, von braun. all right here it is on page uh 17 and this is uh weaponizing space it's chapter is that chapter two yes yeah, yeah. Uh, Werner von Braun, the strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first, the Russians are going to be considered to be the enemy, then terrorists would be identified, then we were going to identify a third world crazies, and then the next enemy was asteroids, which we've had that recently, remember they were going to try to create um, a weapon to destroy them. Right yeah. now, at this point, they had some. They chuckled uh, for the first time. He said, and that the funniest one was what he called aliens, extraterrestrials, and that would be the final scare. And over and over, he would bring up the last card and remember. And so then he he said something: "We are going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens, and all all of it is a lie." That's what Werner von Braun said. And, right, and that was Dr. Carol Rosen's testimony that he was he was putting in. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that quite extensively, and we we keep saying, you know, that's the final card they're playing, and that's what we've been warned from Von Braun, the ex-Nazi, that paperclip, you know, Project Paperclip, him coming over. He he definitely knew that whole agenda that was being brought over by the Fourth Reich after the war, <laughs> and that's the whole other part of the book, of course, but. It was very clear that that's been that's been decades that they've had this planned out um, after 9-11 happened. I mean, the, the actual disclosure project testimony and press club hearing happened right before 9-11 in the spring. So I think that was almost like it wasn't a complete coincidence. That was just the perfect timing to start uh, jumpstart this whole agenda they had in, in place. Yeah. Bon, I don't yeah. believe Ron Bond mentioned all this back in the 70s, I think it was, when he actually disclosed yeah. this. So it was definitely around for, for decades and decades. Yeah. yeah. And I think they, with a lot of the paperclip scientists, they trusted them, but didn't trust them. They knew mm -hmm. that they had knowledge, but wasn't sure if they were still in their spy mode or trying to insert, you know, false information. Or I think there was always this level of distrust. Uh, and and I understand why. I mean, but in the meantime, I, it says that Werner von Braun did not want to create, and uh, he didn't want to be all involved in any kind of space war against the aliens. He thought it was a bad idea. He said mm -hmm. we would be destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. they knew because they had already explored that area, and they knew that uh, this information that they were observing. Uh, maybe the looking glass technology and some other technology that people are not still aware of that uh, enabled them to see into the future. And also some of them actually just went into the future, kind of like what Peter does. He just goes out and goes into different uh, paradigms, um, contexts of existences, realities, parallels, and then returns and, and shares with us what happened. 
And so likewise, uh, you know, the, uh, the Nazis were doing this way back when. And mm -hmm. so that's why people don't realize how much, how further ahead they were than, uh, are, or they still are than us in what's going Grandfather on. Grandfather mentions time travel, mm -hmm. particleization, uh, moving through space and time in the blink of an eye in, in um, his chapter four of this book. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It, it, it's been around for, for at least half a century or more. Yeah. Yeah. The From Boyd particleization. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's pretty intense. I mean, he goes very much into that and talks about all the, the different, uh, talks about the technology as well as the process of how it was done. He also brings up the Aborigines, the Dogon tribe, and others that, you know, have, you know, levels of uh, time travel and understanding of, of space travel without vehicles. Right, exactly. I think it's written all within our, in ancient cultures. And we, of course, like the Merkaba, I mean, that's just showing you the sacred geometry that the whole universe is made up of. The Star of David being, I guess, the two-dimensional version of that. But it's all the symbols you see all over the world. The ancient flower, secret uh, flower of life. Uh, John Barlow, Melchizedek's book. Uh, he, and I know that he was in Taos as well, probably the same time as our grandfather, our grandfather lived there throughout the 90s and I would go visit Taos, all the New Mexico. Yeah, Taos, New Mexico. So he, he even said that Victor Schauberger, or I think Nancy Redstar mentioned this, that supposedly Victor Schauberger lives in Taos at, towards the end of his life. And I don't know if they had met my grandfather or, or not. Or, well, she, she actually told me, I, I talked to Nancy a couple times about this and she said that um, he was the one that introduced Victor Schauberger to her. Um, so. He, he was president in Taos, New Mexico, towards the end of his life, yeah. Yeah, and for people, I guess people that don't know who that is, he was considered the water wizard and dealt with water and torsion and that whole implosion instead of explosion, but implosion and the free energy that would build these ships. And that's what the Germans were really facing it all. He was instrumental right. in the in the uh, UFO um, or, or the and anti-gravitation technology that the Nazis had, you know, pre and post World War II. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So amazing so, connection. Yes, <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. It's, it's really amazing because, you know, they were talking about, they weren't just talking about, they were experiencing it and they were witnessing many different things that we're still not fully able to talk about. Um, including this, this, uh, it was a chapter three, the Kalahari retrievals. Yes. This is an event that happened, a spacecraft that entered South Africa on May 7th, 1989. Um, two Mirage jet fighters using an experimental laser cannon that caused the spaceship to crash in the Kalahari desert. And that's what they were doing. They were, they were um, striking any type of UFO which they yep. were concerned, yep. Werner von Braun was concerned that it was going to incite a war with the, U with the ETs. Mm -hmm. And that's and exactly what, them, yeah. Well, our grandfather, take, oh, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> that then they would take them and back engineer everything. Right, right. And Although, that happened all the way back then in the 50s, yeah. Yeah, and, but I, I do think that what we're experiencing right now may be, in parts, the repercussions of doing some of those things. Oh yeah. Because yeah. a lot of them were guardians here. They're like watching over the planet and helping. Not all of them were malevolent. Right. And uh, I think in, in that process, so it does look like we're, we're the non-friendlies, you know? Yeah. yeah, exactly. We look like we're the ones <laughs> need to stop playing with these toys you know these nuclear weapons and everything else of course and yeah. i think the radar the, the high-powered radar is what our grandfather was working on and early on in his career that's what led to these down ufos and that's why the, they really had all that activity in new mexico is because of that higher powered radar they're using plus the, of course the atomic weapons they were uh testing there so that was, was really sparked the interest of the of these advanced beings to come and start interacting with us, the good and the bad, 
and supposedly some of these down crashes were like a Trojan horse, Trojan horse scenario where they're giving us this technology. There's the, the grays, which our grandfather does mention out of all the races, he really does mention them more than the others, because I think that's where it evolved. They were kind of this, even a lower level type of group and species, maybe taking command from a higher, higher uh, race. And that's kind of the story. I don't know. I'm sure you've heard of this too, but the greats were kind of just like the, the working class and, and the, those that might've been just half human hybrids or, or even androids beings or whatever, but they were there to show there's technology that we could use, but we were making these agreements also. And that was a, and those were agreements that were done. We'll find out from Laura Eisenhower that were done behind President Eisenhower's back by MJ-12 and these other secretive groups. And uh, the, all of that history is, is very important. And our grandfather does kind of go through that and, and mention all those documents and things that started. So, Yeah, uh, Laura, comes, Laura Eisenhower talks a lot about her grandfather. So you both have that in common. You both yeah. have a grandfather who's very interested. Now, both did your grandfathers know each other? I don't, well, he says that he was a Conrad courier for um, President Eisenhower. I don't know if that means they knew, uh, you know, uh, 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 on a on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but to some extent. It may extent, not have been one-on-one, -on -one, but as the, as the Conrad courier, they would carry around the war codes ahead of the president wherever they went. So that, I mean, he had to be within the vicinity and following, you know, in, in that general, uh, you know, sphere of influence with, with, with the president. Yeah. Yeah. And he had a crypto and, and clearance from, from that. And that allowed him to get a lot of the additional access that he, that he got when he saw some of the messages that were decoded back and forth with that crypto clearance. Um, they kind of led, he, he continued to gain knowledge and they elevated his clearance as he learned more, um, cause he was willing to, to, you know, work with them and not, um, you know, come forward with it. Right, right. And, and so, so right now, you guys are actually in a network with Laura Eisenhower. Yeah, right? that's this right. Network. Yeah, yeah you guys correct. are on. So why don't you tell everyone the name of the network that you currently have your shows? Now it's called Infinite TV. So it, it was Conscious Vitality, and now it's Infinite TV, and it's about to actually. Uh, well, it's it's also has its own dad kill coin bitcoin really crypto coin um which uh cryptocurrency so it's it's about to do a launch and i think it's just it's going to be a place where people can actually freely share their ideas um and uh, on anything related to this topic but anything related to health and anything you can't get from the mainstream that's that they're trying to cover up so it's very interesting i met laura actually at a conference before that and we've stayed in touch and She's doing the actually part of the Galactic Spiritual Informers uh, conference later this month in Orlando. So, if people really want to be at some a, a pivotal event in history for disclosure, that is that is going to be the event. And Dr. Sala, Michael Sala, will be there. Um, a lot of secret space program whistleblowers will be there. Um, I plan to be there. So, I, I really I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, our, our um, show on Infinite great. TV is is called Shred the Veil and. Mm -hmm. Our mission really is to explore what's behind this, the narrative, kind of continue on our grandfather's legacy. It's it's really important for us to to get the truth out there, you know. As our grandfather was very uh, adamant about um, aligning with truth and 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 getting the message to the people, and I, it goes back to his you know his ancestry with the Native Americans and just really the, that real alignment of of the true nature of reality. So. Um, we're excited to, to have a, a platform to be able to to carry on that that met, that um, mission really and yeah, kind of yeah. just investigate the rest of the spectrum of what's out there and, and what we might be being lied to about. Right, it's it's good to be in a, amongst a group of people that understand the type of content that you have and those that are serious about gathering new information or being reminded of old information that existed before because we have a plethora of information that's coming out from multiple sources and those that are, um, uh, you know, possibly coming in from the government and, uh, you know, spreading information that mm -hmm. is, uh, creates a detour 
And so, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> it's, so then, you know, you have uh, a bit of confusion, but, um, uh, did you uh, want to cover it all in Majestic 12 and any uh, knowledge that he had or interaction that you thought was interesting or unique? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, we could talk about want... Majestic 12. I mean, initially it was um, from Roswell and then also uh, another crash that's less well known that also happened in New Mexico a couple of years earlier. The the findings from, from those were were to be handled back then in the you know late 1940s by this Majestic 12 group and, and what kind of information was, how it was gonna be handled and the intelligence around that and communication around that, what was the objective of, of Majestic 12. And um, the presidents were, were involved at the, in the initial phase at the time, um, but it very quickly got beyond their control and essentially they, they got to a level where they answered to no one and they kind of, steer the ship as far as what the narrative we see looks like over the last 70 years since then. And yeah, and it's important to remember that was even before Eisenhower, that was during the Truman administration. And there's a memo, even our grandfather includes it in the book, but just just uh, identifying Majestic 12 as the the authority, you know, the main group to take, can, to take care of any information regarding UFOs, uh, that technology, any interaction, was to go through MJ-12, uh, and that had, I think, Ben of our Bush was on that document, and um, and who was the other? There was another, another one high, within the director of Science, uh, Central Intelligence Agency, um, the na the top of the Navy, the top of the Air Force, all of those intelligence agencies were part of that group re really early on. Um, so, yeah, it it's interesting to see what happened and and the role that they played and how truly by the time Eisenhower was even president, he had no control over it. And that's why in his final farewell speech, he wanted to, to make sure people knew and say, beware of the military industrial complex. He, he, he said it as if though he was talking about the future, but in reality, he was talking about what he observed as president, what's already taking place within the government. So. Yeah, yeah, really spawn the, the central intelligence in the in the United States at that at that time back then is, is when it really all all took off and then all these organizations were kind of going reporting up th through them and, and they were the ultimate you know end all be all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and they just kind of uh, took over. But uh, your grandfather was a part of Project Blue Book. So that's another reason why I thought there may have been some uh, communications. And you know, regarding activity, and because he was was he one of the original group that was working with Project? Is that how I read it correctly on the book? He, he I think he might have claimed to be early from the early stages of that because it was in the early fifties. I don't know when Project Blue Book officially started, but he did even claim that he he knew if he was friends with Dr. Heinick or knew of J. Allen Heinick. Um, and what he was doing, Allen Heinick was really going to more of the uh, what non-military personnel, um, just the, what do you call it? Standard civ civilians. civilians. Yeah, the civilians and just uh, trying to get information while our grandfather was on the military side and any witnesses of, and test that wanted to testify or claim they saw something within the military, he would have to go and say, no, you didn't see that. Um, it was swamp gas. It was the hallucinations, whatever the, the typical story was at the time. And so then right. he did... He did also talk about those other levels and threats and how the men in black were basically involved from the beginning as that group that would threaten you and say, you didn't see this. Maybe even mind wipe you. Even, even like the men in black movie shows you they can have that technology to mind wipe you. Maybe, I think they, they probably did at some point too. Um, or they just threatened to kill you or end up disposing you. And the double O boys would come in or the Wackenut uh, group. They'd have these names for these basically assassins. So our, our grandfather wasn't the ones that wasn't one of the threatening ones, but he was one of the first group that would say, hey, you didn't see this, this was your imagination. Well, you know that the men in black are part of the sixth division of the ACIL, which is the division that I'm in. Ah, uh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. And that's- So I, I've yeah, been, I've, I've had encounters been. with them. Yeah, I've, I, I mean, they're, they're friendly to me. I haven't had any problems. It's, um, 
it's when people are doing things that they know are they're not supposed to do and it's not just like oh we don't want the public to know about it but there are certain things that would compromise something else is when they step in but i've heard peter and many times said that he gets irritated by the the men in black because undoubtedly they have stopped him from doing certain things right wow. yeah and it seems and, like they have access to technology right i mean do they can they time travel yeah. and they do pretty much whatever they want and to... yeah they i mean they look humanoid but they're not and they're um uh they can move in a phase shift if you if you want to refer to you know the way that they can move in and out um i i was at a literally like a, a high school baseball game mm. and something was going on and and uh, was some yase was there who was a pleiadian and she was giving me a hard time and uh she sat down next to me on a bench i mean this is like i, I met her right mm. she sat down next to me on the bench she was talking to me but telepathically i was getting information from her and and then I made a comment about her, like, yeah, look, she's looking at me through her sunglasses and she lifted up her sunglasses, like telepathically, wow. this all, she all right. looked right at me. And I contacted Peter and I said, Peter, this is a problem here. And he says, what's going on? I said, um, Samyase's here and uh, I believe the men in black are here. And he goes, oh, he goes, you're in trouble. I said, well, I didn't do anything. I haven't done anything. I'm just here at a high school baseball game. And he said, well, something's going on. I felt like Samyase was doing something. And so um, I, I looked over to my right and there was like, it looked like parents, like a husband, wife. They were both wearing those uh, aviator sunglasses. Mm -hmm. And they, they both turned and looked at me in tandem. Like, like you couldn't have done that naturally. Yeah, wow. they both turned and looked at me, and I looked at them and I'm like, okay, I know exactly who they are, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, he, I mean, I was nervous. I was like, I, I didn't do anything. I didn't know what was going on, but he said that things were happening around us, and uh, we were in upstate New York at the time, so mm -hmm. it did feel really weird. The energy was really mm -hmm. weird, and um, I, and I've they weren't upset at me. I think they needed to observe and see what was happening. And wow. I literally, I went over and I stood right next to them. And the the vibe was <clears throat> is weird. It's a really weird vibe. <laughs> yeah. Um, they will not. They will not intrude, and they will not like cause a scene or make it look really obvious. But um, when their presence is there, you, you know, you can sense that there's something maybe. Um, uh, the time, like time anomaly type of thing going on. Like, wow. you know, the sort of feels a little surreal. So, uh, yeah. The, and, but I, I have found them to be fair. Um, there was another person that was doing some things and he, he, I used to work with him years ago and he talked about how he went after a men in black and he killed one or something like that. Oh, wow. And he had a lot of problems. I don't know if he did or not, but he said that he did and, yeah. or maybe he hurt them, but you know, they're like immortals, so you can't really kill them. And so I, I saw one behind him and I said, there's one behind you. And he says, how do you know that? And I said, cause I could see it, you know, and he was, he was right there. And I said, I think you're in trouble. And he, and I mentioned what it was and he goes, yeah, that's, he goes, yeah, I was doing that. But um, he goes, I, I have a right to do that because he also was like a star seed. And I said, I don't think you're, you have permission to do that. I said, not that I care. It's not my role, but, you know, apparently they're showing up and, and they can do certain things to just stop you, you know, create yeah. a roadblock of some sort. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, did, I did have a, I had a small encounter with my grandfather. Actually, it's not like that paranormal, but maybe like the lower level of the security um, near Dulce, me and my grandfather, we would take road trips sometimes because I'd go there every summer in Taos to visit him. <clears throat> um, but we did go through Dulce. He wanted me to see Dulce. He was like, 
look, I'm going to show you something. I think this is important. He knew of the, the significance of the underground base there and the Dulce Wars. I'm sure he talks about that in the book and being friends with Phil Schneider even. But we went through that area and he, he, he said, all right, we're getting close. This is, this is the Mesa close to where, this, uh, where, where all this activity takes place. And as soon as he started talking about that and we got close, this un black unmarked SUV like pulls up right, runs up behind us and is like right on us. And he's like, okay, I think it means it's time for us to go now. So yeah. basically I had to leave. That right there. I know, I want you to pay attention to that. This is where the people that survive through all of these things <laughs> are the ones that the ones that know when it's time to go. Yeah. And you know, I went with a group of people to um, Montauk and I told Peter, I said, I'm going to go there. He goes, oh, it's a bad idea or whatever. But I thought, well, you know, he didn't really say it was that bad. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I brought a, a group of people with me and I was having trouble speaking. I was like right there by that facility, the famous facility where they did all the experimentation and I felt like I was talking in slow motion and, and it was really affecting me, you know, cause I'm hypersensitive anyhow. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I think we better call Peter. I called Peter. Oh my God. He was furious. He was like, I told you not to go there. What are you doing there? And, and he like literally stayed on, on Skype with me. And as we were driving just to get out of there. And, oh, wow. uh, you know, it's just like, um, you know, you can mess up a mission, you could, you know, there's activity going on, it's connected to the Philadelphia experiment. Oh, and yeah. there's all yeah. these different things happening. And, you know, he did that a few times, you know, I was I was in Prague one time, same thing. He said, what do you he goes, you, you could have gotten abducted, something could have happened. And I said, Well, we got arrested. We got arrested yeah. for <laughs> <laughs> when we were leaving, we were driving out of there and we got pulled over by the police in Germany and they wanted to know uh, what we were doing and they brought us down to the station and they, you know, checked the whole car and everything. It was crazy. Wow. And it's because we went in, into Prague. So you go into these places that you're not supposed to be at and you find out right away that yeah. there, there was a problem. Wow. Nancy Redstar was actually telling me about uh, a similar situation that Derek, the, what Derek described um, when they were working through through the book and, and specifically with the wing makers. Um, our grandfather tried to visit the ancient arrow site in Chaco Canyon, and it was a similar thing. They made it very clear that he was not welcome there at all. And uh, he had to, I mean, he knew he had, he had to leave real fast. Yeah. You know, you know, because what they can do, what can happen is you could, um, I don't know if people want to say it's like bad luck or you could have a series of, of bad things happen afterwards if you're doing something there. Um, yeah. You could find out that you were abducted even though you don't necessarily see any time missing and then like a whole bunch of things are hooked in. Um, wow. I did I did look at that group that I went with in Montauk and one of the guys actually um, was taken by Montauk and we just figured that out. That there was this something there that happened, and I could see him, and then uh, he was used for the projects on something. So mm. um, yeah, it, it can happen, but also um, you can give have like uh, a weird illness. Yeah, something yeah. something could happen. So you need you need to like if if you're feeling like it's time to go, or someone shows up. Uh, the, another thing, like I, I took, we went to different locations to try to clear spaces. And we went to the, the Kennedy compound. And of course, and you know, I believe the Kennedys also are connected to ETs and, and you know, yeah. others. Um, and so they have like this whole area in Hyannis, Hyannis Port, it's like Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And so you drive down the street and then you have to take a right to go directly down to the compound. We didn't even get that far. We just drove up to the street and we parked. And a car came out of nowhere and approached us ah, wow. and told us to move, asked us what we were doing, told us to move and leave. And we said, they said, where are you from? And I told them, you know, where we're, we live. They said, well, this is the way out, you know, just keep going. So hmm. we drove up for a little bit, went to stop again, and they came up from behind us again. 
So we've had multiple incidences like this where they the, the vehicle just shows up. Wow. Yeah. yeah. When you mentioned an, an, an illness, that makes me wonder if, you know, our grandfather maybe experienced that, uh, you know, through this disclosure project when he couldn't, you know, speak his testimony or even when, as Derek was saying, his, his health started to deteriorate with as many strokes as shortly after he came forward with all this information. You know, I'm uh, actually curious about that. You know? Yeah, it is. It is the risk that you take. And like I said, he probably and it seems like he was very, very cautious and careful about these things. But probably there was um, an additional warning and someone saw, recognized what he was going to talk about, and then they stopped him. But yeah. it is unfortunate. I mean, I, I got sick. Um, I, you know, because of some of the work I've done with Peter, and uh, I remember one day I was, I don't know, I wasn't feeling really well. It was a little weird, and I went to lay down. And Peter usually calls me at a certain time of day, and this time there were about eight phone calls from Peter, eight. You know, it was just like, it was crazy. Hmm. And I'm looking at him saying, he, first of all, he doesn't call me that much. Second of all, he doesn't, you know, wouldn't call me consecutively like that. And then third of all, this is not the time that he's usually awake because of the different time zones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up calling him back. He goes, oh, he goes, you're alive. And I'm like, why is he saying that? And so he saw in another reality or another place that I was literally being thrown from a spaceship they tossed uh, me out at a very high elevation oh. and so i was like no i'm fine i feel I'm, I'm okay i feel tired but you know it was something really weird was going on and i felt like i was being moved in some direction and uh supposedly they threw me out of the spaceship into the suez canal and they hmm. created some kind of weird vor vortex because i think my i was trying to keep myself from actually um you know hitting hard and so um then he said that was a time remember when the ship from the suez canal was having problems oh yeah yeah, was getting yeah. stuck in the water he said that that was a the time they i think it was a bunch of um like a, a bad group of pleiadians and i was i was yeah i had a dream that i was yelling at them for hmm. what they were doing to the planet and then they pushed me out the door <laughs> And they just oh. pushed me out. So Peter witnessed me, you know, probably possibly getting killed. But I didn't feel anything immediately. After that, there was a point where I, I could not get out. I could not walk. They literally um, harmed my back. And uh, I, I had a series, a long series of uh, going to the chiropractor. So there wasn't like, I didn't fall. I didn't do anything, but it manifested here. Right. where I had a severe back pain. I think that's important to know, like for people that look at this and, and like remote viewing, for instance, which is you, we know that there's real truth to the sciences, scientific basis to that, but like your astral body or your etheric body is going to another place and going through these, these types of encounters and, and, and it can literally really affect your physical body. I'm sure. Um, depending well, on just, how severe. Yeah. yeah. And I tell people, and I know that probably some of these groups that teach remote viewing, they don't really discuss it with them, but just think of it logically. If you're going mm -hmm. into a high security place, you're looking at them, they can see you. Mm -hmm. And so at the same time, there's different levels of uh, security. So you may have physically a building, there's security guards. They're told to shoot if someone enters the space. Right. Likewise, when you're remote viewing a place that has high security, someone that, that is very intuitive that they do have in those, that's how that's they're right. powerful is they have those spaces. They know when someone's looking in and they can do the same thing. They can yeah. hurt that person. Yeah, I've heard of that. I've heard of like channelers and people that have gone to certain places and they, they feel like they're being watched and they're, being, they're people that are like, hey, what are you doing here? Even, you know, the the, 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 the races, the other ET races that have that ability, of course. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What are you doing here? And then they will then suddenly now they're being watched and they're being surveyed and, and they're finding out information. Some people actually lose their intuition or their, their mm -hmm. uh, inner seeing um, and some of their abilities. Uh, and then sometimes their life goes to chaos and then they lose their relationships and yeah, 
So I've been working for over 20 years with people. I've seen all sorts of different things. And I asked them, you know, what happened or, you know, it was a sequence of events. And uh, it can often be traced back to people that are kind of meddling into certain things that they're not, that was not supposed to be their role here. Maybe their abilities were for something else, but yeah. they kind of got into that direction and someone says, hey, you're gifted. We could use you for this. Um, yes. But they don't tell you about the repercussions to it. Uh, yeah. it's, it sounds like your grandfather understood very well. He he yeah. does go into the technology even back then. He he, it's like he literally laid out what we're what's taking place now, and people are realizing like what's the what's the Havana syndrome or whatever when they actually targeted that government right. or embassy building. I mean, that's literally what he was trying to describe and say, we have the power to do this just to somebody can go in and try to zap your your brain waves and and put some uh, hypnotic scripts into you. Like he used, you know, hypnotic script and, and those terms like he knew about all that, what the CIA, the MK Ultra was doing and how how advanced they truly have become and have been for years. Um, so he knew, and I'm sure that's what made him so freaked out towards the end when he started talking about it. Right, um, when you know the capabilities and what they have the power to do, that, yeah, that, that would be a little terrifying. Yeah, yeah. the Havana Syndrome, I'm surprised they even talked about it, but um, yeah, those people got really sick too. They got very sick. Mm -hmm. And I think it was they used the, the situation that had happened in Havana, Cuba first, but uh, we know mm -hmm. that it's been happening for a while. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, uh, um, did he talk about MK Ultra? I'm trying to remember in the book. Did he reference that at all? I believe he did. I think he did at least once. I mean, he did talk about the CIA, the the Nazi, the Nazi infiltration, and so it, whether he did, you know, he was alluding to the fact of what the capabilities were, the brainwashing. He talked in his, an interview we found of him, a ton, another testimony outside of Disclosure Project. And it's so funny, we just randomly, I randomly found it on the internet from the 90s. It seems very old footage of him talking when he was all still right in his right mind. But he did speak of, he thought so much about brainwashing. He talked about how we learned brainwashing from the Chinese. Um, we learned that in Korea because he fought in the Korean War. So he talked about brainwashing and the Chinese influence and how they're the, they're the greatest power that we will ever have to face and that we have, should be afraid of. And he said that in the 90s, um, basically because of, of, of that capability and, and using mind control, basically getting a whole, a whole army behind you because you almost have like a hive mind at the end of the day. You're, you're so afraid or not maybe not afraid but you almost lack the ability to, to discern for yourself you you just follow along whatever you're, you're being told from day one that's how they're they're basically groomed as after generation but he also claimed he also meant i'll say it but i don't want you to get banned but you know about he did mention that he said you know in the military you go in and you get you get those all the time you go and get shots all the time or um you know you, you think you say oh i'm sick or oh, i'm depressed i need a shot and he said well sometimes you you think you, you know you you get what you think you're getting and sometimes you don't get what you think you're getting like you know, no it's not really what it is and he said all that way back in, in, back in the 90s very talking about that. so he kind of laid it all out yeah yeah because there there have been lawsuits or you know you see um, I've talked to people in the military where they're have have done you know incredible work, even people in special ops, and then they retire. And I think mm -hmm. there's even a movie about it and how like they're um, not only no longer needed but viewed as potentially dangerous and maybe um, considered to be eliminated. So <laughs> you know that's uh, once you serve or whatever and you finish and you you're not uh of of use or purpose i mean that's maybe right. there, there are but yeah i think that's I where would... this um shadow group came from is mm -hmm. the people that were somewhat considered retired or whatever and uh then decided to create their own uh leadership and ruling mm -hmm. of of whatever they could do and they're so elite 
regarding their tech technology and their abilities that mm-hmm. they can they can completely sabotage a whole nation you know mm-hmm. between uh, propaganda and mind control and and uh scalar and and all sorts of things and have people fighting against each other which we've seen oh, things yeah. like that happening it's a war on consciousness then that's literally the, that's world war three and we're, we're literally living it right now i think i mean it's not going to be fought with weapons it's fought with social media it's fought with propaganda and and the brainwashing aspect of it i think he was well aware of that um and i think like michael jacob's a great example of an intuitive warrior and he's coming out with that information of how those skills have helped him in all all of his missions in the past but that's more that's relied upon by the government way more than people realize i mean so much more than people realize like those people that are intuitive that's that's they're like they're the front lines or they're the ones that really help in a lot of these missions and and do the work and the secret i think it's a combination yeah 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 the people that have those abilities too the physical abilities as well Mm -hmm. with Mm -hmm. intuition yeah it's it's kind of a powerful force but also it can be worked used uh for the negative as well um we have um regarding china uh, they have uh, their social credit system and their implementation of many of the uh, propaganda or whatever, what have you, that's kind of come through into the U.S. And we're seeing that they even have a police force that are in s- certain cities right now. And uh, people don't even that. realize it. Yeah. And so I said to some people about it uh, that we have a problem. They said, well, when's this war going to happen? Are they just going to start bombing us and everything? I said, no, why? They don't need to. They I said, they to. can just step in and sit down, have a desk, have a building, and, and yeah. they're, they're pretty much ready to go. I mean, because they have uh, used the, the understanding of um, how to run humanity in such a way, and they've taken advantage of that but they yep. see that yep. we're foolish enough to not have guarded us ourselves. So, um, and also the, the and manipulation of the public. Yeah. 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 So it got into something pretty, pretty serious. So everyone's waiting for this big war. Meanwhile, they're, they're, like you said, they're, they're already, you know, doing this. They've and already just integrated like, us. Yeah. 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 Just like you, you said your grandfather knew about it and uh, you have an awareness of it. It's, it's hard to talk about this with some people there. They have cognitive dissidence and, and they just do not want to acknowledge that this is happening right now because it just, yeah. just doesn't make any sense. You know, they mm-hmm. it, it's almost like when the um, the uh, British military was fighting. And they would do it in the open and, and they had, you know, everything was, they were, they were in, um, they were lined up and showing themselves wearing bright red clothing, you know, Mm -hmm. and then the game changed with this, the uh, revolutionary soldiers in the Minutemen who were dressed in drab clothing and they were hiding behind, you know, they, they started introducing like a guerrilla warfare and it changed the game. And so likewise, uh, China China has changed the game. It's just that no one is acknowledging it, so you can't really counteract it. Yeah, and, and all those handshakes that have gone on behind the scenes, and some that are more obvious than others, but we just we just assume like, oh no, you know, the news would never lie to us, or you know, the government would never lie to us. What, what we see every day and what they tell feed us every day has to be the truth. And I think it's finally breaking down that people realize that it's not. And maybe that's the best thing that happened for us is these past couple of years of such chaos. But it was the one trigger that we needed to wake up like as, qu- as quickly as possible, I guess. Right. Yeah. The shame yeah. is it's gone on so long and, and people are just indoctrinated to, to believing it all. I mean, President Kennedy warned us about the guerrilla tactics that would be the you know downfall of our, our, our country. And it's just continued since then. And it's. I guess the timing had to be right for people to finally wake up on a, on a mass level to see it and, and for what it really is. But it's uh, it's been way too long. You know, another thing people have been bringing up, and I, and I agree 100%, uh, another thing that if people want to check the validation of these uh, ideas, they can see that, you know, you mentioned the handshakes. 
the handshakes are um, a, a lot of them are done with uh, private deals. And so you're seeing politicians that make a specific wage mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. in, the, in the past 20 years are coming out as multimillionaires. And oh, it's yeah. like, all right, so where did they get that money? I mean, or is the American public paying them or um, where is all this money coming from the U S that's going to the Ukraine? Exactly. Um, you know what I mean? It's exactly. like this endless source of income. And uh, suddenly to become a president is you become a billionaire. I mean, that's, that's unheard of. Exactly. Yeah, pull that yeah. thread and start asking the right questions because a lot of people just are ignorant to it, you know, connect the yeah. dots. And so I, I was going to say this about Ukraine. I don't want to, I don't want to get too political or, but you should always, <laughs> you should always look at where, where are we focusing our attention and where is the war being fought at least, you know, on grand ground zero. And this is true with nine 11. And, and I think, you know, this Jessica too, that the reason, some of the reasons we went to that area was to, to wipe out all the, the, the actual history, the ancient history that uh, from Mesopotamia, our, our, our true heritage our true, uh, basically true history and how we came about and how more much more advanced we were in ancient times and a lot of that they wanted to wipe away before before it could become mainstream and public and in the same way in Ukraine look at why we go to Ukraine and what they're trying to maybe you know they're trying to bomb it looks like just innocent people or here and there but think about Ukraine is really like the gateway between the East and the West and probably so much of human trafficking for one, drug trafficking, all these major deals that happen and handshakes that happen come through Ukraine most likely. So I don't know, people need to look at that for what it is and why the war is being waged there now so, so much. In our, in our leadership, uh, personally having, uh, owning businesses and, and um, you know, facilities that have, uh, bioweapons and all sorts of things so their their hands are in mm. they're, they're in pretty deep and you know we're we're sitting here vulnerable in a way you know not trying to figure it out um mm -hmm. i one of the things that i did do years ago was i went and visited a new york city near ground zero after it happened to try to um lock and close any portals and uh um i talk about it in my book um the andronicus transmissions so this is a the book where I talk about in the beginning. And that's also my channeled information that I have from uh, Andronicus, who is from Andromeda. And I did that for years from 2015 up to about 2019. And then I had to stop uh, because just like being sensitive to certain things. And I had a discussion with those that I was communicating with that um, I needed to go um, more quiet and continue doing the work. Uh, and then uh, Peter stepped in very strongly around 2016, 2017. And uh, then 2018, we really, you know, started to do a lot more together. So, um, and I understood my role a lot more, you know, regarding uh, helping, helping him to uh, in the ACIO to also help uh, humanity, but not just humanity, it's, it's galactic, it's um, intergalactic. So, uh, and, and I believe that you guys are a part of this, you know, definitely, um, have, have, uh, responsibility and you are uh, holding the torch. And I know that people, when they, uh, love their relatives, that they do that. But I think that, um, for the love of humanity, that the information that's there would really, as I said, I can't stress it enough, would really create a basis of knowledge that we could go to a next level of information from there. Yeah. Yeah. And I like how you put it. I think there's needs to be layers, like almost like a college of disclosure and information for people on a very basic level to understand things, but then maybe those that are well already ready to hear of, of the other, other uh, more advanced type of information. I mean, I think it, yeah, we almost have to consider it that way when we, when we disclose like, and share. Yeah. Like a school, you're not going to be able to, dive deep into the more advanced stuff that you, your brain can't even fathom w without having a, a foundational groundwork of, of where it all started from, right? Right. 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 Or the sequence that led up to certain things. Some people think some of these ideas are new. And some people also think mm -hmm. that uh, the study of um, 
uh, working with these uh, the particles and quantum physics and all that uh, goes back to just you know the the, the um, free energy and all that just goes back uh, to Tesla and um, but there's uh, other players that have been involved and other mathematicians and science scientists yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, Peter you know keeps revealing information that kind of blows us away. You know, like uh, he recently uh, revealed some information about Alistair Crowley and the ET mm -hmm. that he said it was a hybrid that he was communicating with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I made a lot that. of sense. Yeah. yeah right. Interesting. So, I, think my, so as, I think my brother has to, oh, did you go ahead? I, I don't know if Dan has to leave soon, but I was just going to say, hopefully we can mm -hmm. continue. And I hope, I hope too, I was going to say, hope we can get in touch with Peter too soon. That would be great yeah um, yeah we're, we're yeah. kind of unless there's i told him uh that, that you know i mentioned that that he wanted to connect with you guys um but he is uh finishing up he had two like couple back-to-back -back missions and then he had to fill out this huge report he said in the show <laughs> this really big report so he's getting a little closer and you know we we have to even do a, a discussion um, regarding uh, Unit 374 that was with him during those oh, missions. Right, so, um, right. and then we're, we're working our way there, trust me. <laughs> Great. But yes, it's, it, it feels like it's that time. And I didn't cover all the all the um, ideas and information, but I'm going to hold on to these notes. And right. then uh, if we have time do, after doing the second show, then we can do that. Does that sound Perfect. good? Yeah, yeah, that'd be okay. good. Okay. So really with that said, I want yeah, if you guys want to say uh any last uh ideas or thoughts. I'm just grateful that you you had us on and we're we're just really honored to be able to share this with you on your platform and and get this knowledge out here and and thank you for taking the time to to go through the chapters with us and and really kind of um give it some some credit and 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 let people become aware of, of what what the real truth is. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, same, same, just thanks so much for having us. And I think, uh, yeah, I always like to say it's more about following your intuition and, you know, don't, don't take our word for it. Go and go and search for the truth because that's what our grandfather told us to do. He didn't just come out and say everything at once to us and say, this is, this is, this is all you need to know. He just said, go, if you're interested, go read that book. And this is a good starting point. And I, I adapted his library, inherited his library and and I think intuitively added on the right books and the right pieces from that point. But everybody has the ability to do that. If they truly are looking inside for the answers, they'll listen to their heart and their mind as well to, to find the answers. That's great yeah. advice. Yeah. And thank you, Derek and Daniel. It's been an honor to be to have you on here. Thank you for uh, bringing up information about your grandfather. I would have never really looked at this book. I hadn't heard of it before. And I've been enjoying reading it. And we will continue this conversation next time. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And have a good day. You have been listening to Androna Talks Radio. Join us on YouTube channel, Jessica Errol Morocco. And visit her website at www.readingsbyarial.com. Thank you.